Okay, we might get started again. Our next talk is, and our final talk, is Print the Final Frontier. Our speaker is a core um, Inkscape developer. <laughs> yeah, whatever. And has been working in print and media for several decades. Could you please put your hands together for John Cruz? <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Now, my talk this time is going to be about print, real print, getting something physical. So usually we're talking, going to be talking here about stuff more than just the casual hook your uh, $40 inkjet printer up to your laptop and go. But not scaling from one step above there on, not, not necessarily way off at the top. So. What, what we're going to discover is that I really believe this is the... Oh. No, 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 no. There we go. This is the year of Linux in the print shop. There's been a lot going on, a lot moving, and especially why I call this the final frontier is because being able to be used, the whole open source software stack, from Linux all the way up, being able to be used in professional graphic design houses is finally just about there. It's taken quite a while to get it all the way, mainly because people want to make sure they get it right. This is one of those things where it's easy to get something that's almost there, but it's hard to get it right. <clears throat> so what are we going to be going over? Probably, hopefully, end up with the points that you understand where the uh, areas are that Linux has to move into, Linux and open source and applications and drivers and whatever else you have in there. Uh, to learn what sort of issues are present preventing acceptance by professionals. And that means everybody who says, oh, Linux is a toy, we can't use it in my business you need to maybe hopefully get some understanding of the objective and subjective problems blocking Linux adoption in this area and to consider area where different contributions might be made which finally might here we might get some good momentum coming out of this although I will admit if anyone attended Rusty's welcome talk you have to remember do not start more than one new project this year. Okay. <laughs> I'll grant you that. So, for the overview, well, I'm going to try to give you a quick summary of uh, print professionals, some of the needs, the problem areas, as I mentioned. Uh, address the commonly heard statement. Who, who here has ever heard, I need CMYK? How many of you have said it? Okay, some of those, a third have seen it. Okay. And that how I'm seeing that Linux does serve the masses, but, and we're going to come back on to that. So who might be considered print professionals right now? I'd say photographers, anyone who produces beautiful art. And there are several here I know of who either, either as heavy duty, hardcore hobbyists or semi-professionals or the occasional freelancer do some really amazing work. Graphic designers. Anyone in here happen to be a graphic designer by practice or profession or dabbling? Yes, we have at least some in here. That's good. Uh, publishers. Publishers could go all the way from your standard big house that puts out dozens of books a quarter to just, you know, your little corner leaflet things. You know, you can scale that down a little. Um, artist. Anyone here an artist? Nothing, nothing, maybe slightly one. Yeah, they're not here at this conference. That's where we actually have a lot of input at the Libre Graphics meetings, which is something else to look up, where they try to intentionally bring together artists and developers and creative people and everyone all together to mix it up. Because otherwise, you get this. How many are in this room? None? Okay. <clears throat> now, of these people, the professionals, which operating system do they use? Mac, almost hands down. Any, any of the graphic designers that don't want to be made fun of by other graphic designers? <laughs> not necessarily seem professional or not, but the, they'll be using Macs. Some on Windows, 
And a few high-end, you get some high-end, especially publishers and, and other really technically advanced type people using Unix, or had been. That's, those are getting eclipsed slightly, but not Linux, especially, and not some of the applications. So just to, to throw out real quick, we have some different pro professionals with different types of needs. Fine art reproduction, trying to create lithos or prints for a gallery. Photographs of gallery art, exhibited artwork. That's an extremely different, verified kind of area all unto itself. General photography. Uh, you have a lot of professionals who do photography, wedding photography. Is in our area one of the big industries. You get individuals who go out on the weekend, make their living shooting other people's weddings and giving the people some nice prints and books at the end that, since it's a wedding, are intended to last quite a while. And you do not want those looking cheap or poor or you don't stay in the business. And then you have large offset print runs, which, you know, here I might say, ah, here's a very nice poster, but this is not really what I'm talking about. This is more like a giant inkjet printer just digitally dump this out. You get books, fine art, coffee table books especially, those will have very nice production quality. So when you're producing this poster versus some other posters even, you might encounter completely different technical needs. And here is one area that I come up with constantly, even a few times today. Whereas, whereas people in one area think that applies to the other. Hollywood and television, film, production, I point out, because those are the people who at the one extreme even say there is no need whatsoever for any color management at all. That's because among other things, in the US especially, television is so well defined, you know exactly what each numeric level is supposed to be defined by precise engineering and all your displays are calibrated and you pull out the oscilloscopes and everything and measure your signals, you get everything controlled, at least in theory. So they don't realize what they need, and so they just strip everything to this one standard, but they forget everybody else is not them. And so we have, you know, some of that issue coming around. Uh, now, problem areas. Who is familiar with color management in general? One, two, quarter, maybe a third. So on other operating systems than Linux, although, yes, this is running Linux now, so don't lynch me when I'm not looking. It's Macintosh, Mac OS, Windows. It's handled by the operating system. Linux, it's not, <laughs> at least yet. And there are certain things that it's not expected to. If you need something, you put that something on there. You don't get one big can that does everything for everybody. You get what you need, which is good and bad. But here, it just means we have to explicitly address it. And it is covered in specifications such as PostScript and PDF. And all the high-end print is now pretty much moving to specialized um, targetings of PDF. So if you see someone who's in the book industry, who's making a 400-page book with color plates and everything else, you, chances are PDF is going to be going out there at some point, but professional PDF. Not the PDF you get out of Inkscape right now. <clears throat> and then when you were going to... The problem there is when you go to a four color or offset press. You know, this printer may have been printed by kind of a pr different process for this poster here, but when you get separate plates for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, or six color now, that's very common. Spot inks. So if you're using Pantone colors or resin paints or some of the other, I think HKS perhaps, anyway, in Europe you have other standards too. And then you have the non-trivial print work. So this has kind of been expressed before. For 80% of the people, you don't, they don't need any of this. So why, why bother? Well, it's for the other 20% of the people you do need to get, know what trapping, true black, knockout. Who knows what the, these terms refer to? Uh, one, two people? Yeah, that's the problem. Well, that's why you're here. <coughs> so let's look at probably the biggest issue that comes up over and over and over. When you hear people say, I need CMYK. You need four colors. So why aren't you using Linux? Because I need CMYK. I'm going to stay on Windows. 
because I need ZMYK, I'm going to stay with the proprietary vendor software. You know, well, do they? My, my usual answer is no, you don't. You think you need it, but you don't. And this holds true for large numbers of users out there. So you, in fact, whereas in the back, in the dark ages of printing and everything else, you had to be able to tweak the separations to be able to get a decent print of your photograph out. If you're working in color images, though, in general, especially photographs, because that used to be the area where you wanted it to be just right, so you had to do, but now photographers can get better results by sticking to RGB. Adobe, even in Impress and their professional print work, mentioned late binding or late conversion. So keep it in RGB until the very last moment before you prep your file to send off to the printer to run on a specific, to the print house, to run on a specific printer. So that's for a large majority, I believe. You don't need it. But the problem is that doesn't hold true for everyone and especially the professionals. Now, is Linux just a toy operating system? Well, when it comes to the enterprise business needs uh, server, no. When it comes to the graphics, arts, creative side, yes. It really kind of still is, at least for maybe, hopefully, only a few more months. But a lot of this of the I need, I need, are just old habits that are outdated and actually cause you, you they got in the habits because they needed to do this, but nowadays those habits are getting in the way of them achieving what they really want. So, okay, for, for some of the people, maybe you do need it. So when you talk to someone, you, you, if this comes up, you have to feel them out, find out why, okay, why do you need it? How in your workflow does, does, do you require it? Because there's a chance that you need it, but of course, most likely is they don't. But what we, especially here at LinuxConf, you have everybody here who cares about getting it right. You know, you don't want to say, oh, leave the professional market to somebody else. We don't care. We're good enough. <laughs> I don't think that's going to fly. So at the moment, like I said, the, that 80% of the market maybe, just, you know, just citing a rough 80-20 rule, no, nothing actual concrete or data-wise there. RGB printing close enough, or even eyeball. You're not, your monitor isn't even calibrated. Why should you worry about anything else? Or how can you? You can't. Don't worry. It's good enough for them. Uh, so that's leaving the high end professionals to the proprietary vendors, the expensive. So you're talking Creative Suite, where I could go to, for the price of Adobe Creative Suite, I could go down to the corner in California and buy a decent, decent used car. That just doesn't seem quite right to me. And movie studios are also another one. They have other reasons too, but they often have high-end proprietary stacks of all the stuff they do that they don't want anyone else to be able to do. And that's where you know, open source can come in and take the wind out of their sails there. It's already worked on the operating system and file system and storage, so we can finish releasing their grip a little there too. But where it's really failing is the independent artists who can't afford Creative Suite unless they steal it. And then suddenly, you're, uh, technically at some point, you might be rated by the BSA and then you're gone. You're done. Or a small business. Small businesses already have a tough enough time. They can't afford all these extra proprietary lock-in taxes. And freedom advocates. How many people got hassled even in, you know, kindly, brotherly ingest about running Mac OS here at this conference. Well, my response was, sure, I run Linux when I can, but I cannot always run it. Fix it so I can. <laughs> so you don't, you don't care about graphics, you don't care about art, you don't care about anything else, but you care about freedom. You care about being open. Fix it. So that finishes the overview, and now we're into the part <laughs> where the pain comes in. Ouch. So where is the pain? Applications. Most don't do what people need it to do. To get you the technical control, to get the full power, they're just not there. Libraries. Kind of there, almost, sort of. Some of them, they're not. Drivers, print subsystems. 
So in applications, we have things like S SK1, Krita, Scribus. Those do pretty good job. I mean, like Scribus is the full high-end publishing tool. You can crank out anything, at least I think, at least as good as any other proprietary publishing tool out there. And you send it to the print house, you get the book from Amazon in your hand, and it looks nice. I have some, but I didn't bring it because of the weight. <laughs> Inkscape, which I help work on, is mostly there. There's a couple things, like you can work in good, full, multicolor print with spots and whatever other overlays you want, but if you go to export a PDF directly from Inkscape, it gets flattened out to RGB and just is not there. GIMP, they're working on moving there, they're taking their time, but they're trying to do it right. The print-specific workflow needs a little work. Last I spoke with them, they may or may not have figured out all the issues yet. Most, mostly the usability is, the usability people they have improving it now and the core technical people never worked in print. They don't know some of the trickiness. So they think, oh, it's simple, just, just don't, don't worry about it. Doesn't quite work. But then you also have a lot of applications that don't do anything, but probably don't have to. I mean, your web browser. Close enough. You do just a little bit, everything else is good. Emacs. I, I don't know anywhere specifically where Emacs needs to be doing color management, even though when I open it up and in current Emacs, if I open an SVG, I get it showing up as a graphic inside the Emacs window, but that's someone else's code. So I mentioned the libraries having issues. The, you have the toolkit libraries and the dedicated libraries. Toolkits like GTK and Qt, applications are built on top of. The thing there is if you get those fixed correctly to at least handle pass through of the advanced data and fall back to the common end user simple cases, then all the applications built on top of those, including all the KDE apps and all the GNOME apps, will gain from that. So occasionally they're, they're going to need a little bit of tweaking now, here and there, but they'll come through pretty well if you, they know what to be done. Uh, dedicated libraries for more graphic specific Cairo, Poplar, GoScript, Comp. ICC, that's I, by the way. Cairo is the graphics rendering API. Carl Worth, who's wandering around here somewhere, has been working on that forever. He's gotten, that's what Inkscape uses to export PDF. It does not have good print output yet, because we haven't finished defining the API. The good news is we are almost there. Poplar Inkscape, for instance, uses that to read PDF. We need to bump that up. GhostScript. Who here is familiar with GhostScript? About half. So the open source PostScript renderer and interpreter that's used all over the place on the uh, Linux desktop. Last year, in fact, at the Libre Graphics MiniConf at, L, um, at LCA 2010, gave the maintainer of that gave a good presentation about how they were just finishing switching it all over to be clean and ICC based and allow profiles and multiple channels and all the good stuff. So that's that's, that one's almost pretty much done. And Comp IVC is a new one. If you care about making your app do the right thing, you might Google that one and see what it is. So then we have print subsystems, CUPS, which is rendering all over the, running all over the place. It is hiding in OS 10, kind of sort of maybe, I don't know, the latest state of, state of branching. But it's common and established for serving a lot of prints needs, and that has cleaned up a lot. Gutenprint kind of rides on top of that and on top of GhostScript and can do some of the, used to be the GIMP print code, got moved out to be a shared common thing. Google Cloud Print, now that's another very new, came, uh, released this week. Uh, the word I've heard most often in referring to it was interesting. <laughs> I have my file here, I'm going to send it up to Google's cloud and wait and then they'll send it down to my printer over here and then it will come out. Of course, I have to be connected to the cloud, I have to be logged in, I don't have a Google print enabled printer because no one's making them yet, so I have to run a proxy. Good, no, wait, except they only have a proxy for Windows right now. So, oh, okay, well, I'll just put that on, I'll try it. No, but you have to be there and logged in for it to actually work. You know, why don't I just plug in a cable, come on. Why don't, and, and it turns out the proxy is actually Chrome. So it's, it's, 
intended to help Android devices and Chrome OS um, might be interesting, might be able to do a good job for some of the areas. Some of the things it's good for may not need any color management or advanced color printing because it's not going to serve that market. You know, I don't know, it's new. Very interesting to see what goes on with that. And, and let's not even start with the security implications. So where, as I mentioned, to, with this year being, I think, very interesting and pivotal, where, where are things standing? Well, let's see. <clears throat> there are experts all over the place at many different levels and many different areas. People who are really good at drivers. People who are really good at apps. People who are great at understanding the artistic creative process and who teach photography classes and who hack on the code all at the same time. You know, things like this. Really nice. People who do the hardcore, low-level math of a color management system and few that have written their own, all available for everyone to use openly. You know, applications. Yeah, there's a few people who know applications here and there. I fall into that wonderful point where we contact the users. Print drivers usually don't interface with the users. Apps kind of do. Now, in this field, things have been very dynamic. Literally, just last, year, last week or so, as I was getting ready to fly down here, I thought, oh, great, I'll, have, I'll finish all my slides up before I come, have my talk all typed up so I can have notes in the slide deck and everything. Then someone went and released a new demon that fits right in the middle of this whole thing and does things the way he said, here's this brand new beta, try it out, tell me what you think, where should I change it? Literally hundreds of messages showed up on that mail thread, just one thread, just this in the last, um, well, two weeks now since it's, it happened. Very active. But the good news is everybody is on there. You have the guys who write the applications, the guys who write the printer drivers, you, the GoScript guys. You have the guys who do the CMS and a couple of us who do applications, all communicating with each other, informing each other how stupid we each are and how we're just not getting it. Hopefully, and, and that's why I went to Ken McKinney's talk on um, Wackadroid and trolling and understanding and extracting our requirements. This thread isn't anywhere near that, you know, confrontational, but it's, it's helpful. It's, it's coming along. So, as the state of the field is very interesting and everything else, now moving forward though is what, well, where is the problem? Where is it still an issue? Well, the painful cases involve trapping, masking, knockout, overprint, related terms. Some depends where you've been trained and what you're used to. You might know things as different names. Then there's an idea of rich black. How many people are familiar with rich black or true black? <laughs> Three, okay. And then, and then there's black text, which is something completely different. Then those things we do need to allow control over. I don't care what anyone argues who's used to doing photographs and everything. People who do real print on real offset press do need to be able to control these things. Some of the others, such as the beautiful artist who did all the beautiful work on um, the LCA 2010 shirts and worked so beautifully with the printers to come up with a, an amazing piece of art out of that. Um, the, you're down to tweaking ink limits, dot size, half tone, angles and printing, so although to understand that one, how many people are familiar with the details of half toning? Angles, LPI, screening, a uh, handful. Okay, so I have this handy little reference I pulled from Wikimedia Commons. I, I think it was the Commons. <clears throat> the, Wik, Wikipedia has a great article explaining this if you care about the technical details, but to go over it in general, four colors. Cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, which is black. K from, comes from key. Anyway, those four colors, you can't actually mix the colors. So what the way Offset Press works is they make little dots in different patterns at different angles and overlay them so that you get different, these different patterns that from any distance, your eye blurs together into the appearance of a specific color. So in essence, that's the root of the problem. Once you start to get into like that, you used to have to create these little dot files yourself. Then you used to have to go to a high-end rip to 
do these and produce them and spend hundreds or thousands of dollars per separation and you know that's moving away now but still you know that's the low-level ugliness so it really helps especially to keep this in mind is that when you're trying to print something precise the printing process is creating these little patterns of dots of all sorts of different colors and different sizes at different angles that kind of, if you look at the edges of something that's been printed, especially if you pull up a magnifier, the edges of everything are all blurry. Now in photographs that's great because everything naturally blurs into each other a little bit anyway. So, so we're good there. But, flipping order on you in case you may have expected the other, I'm going to mention black text. So if you're printing a small little eight point word for your fine print and you're trying to make that letter visible and they're made up of big blobs of shapes kind of near each other, you're not going to be able to see anything. So when you go into text and other things like that, you want to say, no, 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 don't use the patterning and mixing inks and all that. Just use one ink, solid edge, as fine as you can. That's what you need to do. And that keeps the edges crisp, keeps small things visible. Sometimes it makes things worse, sometimes it makes it better. It depends on the situation. A good graphic designer knows this and will check and see. And you get the, get the results in your hand after it's been created by a good graphic designer and a bad graphic designer, and you can tell the difference. And you can tell why those people are worth the money they charge. Then there's this other idea of rich black, which is not black text. This is something different. This is where black is not black. If you define black as printing only the black ink, when it comes out on paper, that black ink won't be able to get quite full saturation. So if you add a little cyan, a little magenta, a little yellow, also in that same area, in the right combination for that paper, you'll get a good black that's not brown or muddy that looks even better. Or sometimes you're being artistic, you want it to be a warm black or a cool black. You can twink by adding a little more um, cyan or a little more red to warm it up or cool it down and you can graphically, a good graphic designer can pull out this kind of stuff and make it beautiful. And then the really fun one is trapping. <laughs> Masking, overprint, knockout, that's what we're talking about here. So I have a quick little overview showing in the top corner the expected results. The next to it, can you see anything wrong with the one at the top on the right? Here's the problem. Those inks were printed separately. We're not perfect. And you're, when you don't pay thousands of dollars per page on a print job, you're not going to get perfect print either. It's going to shift off maybe a little. And the more it shifts, the more gaps and overlaps and muddying and everything you're going to get. Or, in the middle on the left there, it's a little bit smaller than you thought. You notice there's a little white kind of exposed between the two. So you want to prevent any of those two happen. So in the middle on the right, that is the common solution you get that is by making the one color, so you take away the blue, first of all, because if you put blue ink, and, or the, the inks that result in blue and the ink that's, that result in yellow all in the same spot on the page, you're going to get a muddy green. You're not going to get blue, blue. So it has to cut out, not print blue, where you're going to be printing the yellow in this case. But in the bottom two, I have a little zoomed in so you can see what's going on is on the left that's the ideal perfect what I wanted that's what I designed that's what I saw in my graphic app on my desktop so I thought I was good but no I'm a professional I know I have to make it a little bigger so the yellow of the S was made a little bigger than the negative cutout of where it's not going to be putting blue so there'll be a bit of an overlap and what in theory, what you want is just enough overlap to be 100% sure you don't leave any white gaps, but not too much overlap so that you cause color blurring or any other problem like that. This is subjective. You don't want this in a photo. You do want it on a logo. You don't want it in text on somebody's shirts in a picture. You do want it on text that's been overlaid on the picture that's your corporate slogan. You can't leave that to the automated back end. The designer has to throw that in. So just to sum up uh, before the final phase, first of all, here, what can you do? <laughs> give, number one thing, give feedback and collect up simple use cases. 
for the usability of people. You just tell them, oh, you said, I don't need these buttons in my dialog, but how can I end up with this when I go to print? How can I control the knockout? Oh, I didn't think of that. What, you know, bring it up and then discuss, find out what's going on. The mailing lists are all public. And then tell, just maybe just tell the developers of the apps you use that you want the good power. You want to be able to do everything. You don't want them to say, oh, you're just a stupid little average user. We're not going to let you do anything professional quality. And then you're going to wind up very quick the last few minutes with a bit of research, because what's a talk without some research? So I was thinking as I was getting ready, how, how should I research? I'll show you some just co quick concrete example of a little bit of the color issues you have to deal with and maybe control. And I realized, my recycle bin. <laughs> so I just, one morning before I took everything out, I went through the boxes very quickly and pulled pieces out. And cut, cut out what actually is in my house so that you guys can see and use it. Oh, that's not so useful. <laughs> let's, let's see if you can actually see it. Okay, so here's a sample. There's just your basic four color print on a box, CMYK. Problem is it was looking a little washed out. The box itself seemed anemic and just not that exciting for a product that's maybe not what you want. But, you know, it, it got the job done. You know, that, okay, just take your RGB and automatically convert to CMYK. Okay, that might work. But then I had another box that was also CMYK that had some better printing on it. Very, looked at a much nicer box. And you could tell they, they had some quality on the production quality. But what is slightly hard to see here, but if you download the slide deck, you'll be able to see. So they had cyan, magenta, yellow. Then they created blue by mixing two of those. They created red by mixing two other. So, and then um, they created green by mixing two of the others. You go to Wikipedia, they'll tell you which gives you what. But the last two, the bottom one is black. Check the slides though, but the one above it is cyan, magenta, and yellow all put together. In theory, would be black, but it's really just a very, very dark gray. So you can check the slide on that one. Now here's another common thing. Is it CMYK? Nice little thing, and we have some good registration marks. Those are the little like targets that let them line up the results of the print to keep it more in line. But this place had six inks, not four. So I checked, they had cyan, magenta, and yellow, black. Then they had a spot color, which is some maybe Pantone color or something. Then they also had a deep gold metallic ink also on there that were just printed in solid places in a couple of spots in the package. So that, the goldish color, you can't tell here, but it's actually a metallic ink. Has to be printed separately. You can't use CMYK to fake that. And then I just found one that was a quick little one with three little spot colors, not even mixed blending inks to make colors. And the registration, you know, the, it, nothing's quite lined up, but it was just a very cheap, large, mass-produced product that didn't care, and that was fine. Then we have one that was six color ink and they add ochre and green. And in the registration marks, well, first of all, they're, they're a little bit off, not as bad as that other package, but I noticed something interesting. They had a little letter O and a little letter G. The O was actually green and the G was actually ochre. <laughs> so they, turns out in the next package of the same type of product from the same manufacturer, they just got rid of those letters anyway because they kind of, you know, oops, okay. But here you have six different inks that are all six are mixed to create the dot pattern. So that's, and this is just common samples. So if this is a very common thing to find in the street, someone might need it. And then I measured the values just to see what's going on because you need some raw data. So I took a photograph of all of them all at once, measured the RGBs, gave them SUV, or you can't tell what's going on. But then, you know, I grafted a little and we can see the first print that I said looked anemic its values are different from the others. The others are pretty well in line, so industry is doing good. But, you know, depending on what their needs are, they get different. So given 
all that hopefully will give at least something to bring you to your mind some pause and after some reflection you might get some questions or maybe later this week so we'll start now see anyone have a question uh, as a user of Inkscape would you uh, recommend that uh, I export things to SVG and port them in SK1 before I print them? <clears throat> well, as a user of Inkscape, it depends on, I have not ver checked what SK1 does on import yet. In general, it, that does a really good job printing, or Scribus. Now, Scribus doesn't import all SVG features, but it does do the color management part of it. So if you've tagged something to be a special ICC profile color for a certain plate, Scribus will pull it in for sure. SK1, if it doesn't, it should take just a tiny little tweak on their part. So those are the two good ways to get good print output are going into those two programs. Any more questions? One up the back. Sorry, this is a bit sideways, but um, you mentioned color cal calibration of displays earlier. Yes. Um, is there, what's the technique you use on Linux for c collaborating LCD? Ah, so that's a good, good question. You can get hardware colorimeters, and I happen to have one here. This hard, type of hardware runs maybe 50 to 100 dollars. And many, many of the consumer level ones that are all down at that price are well supported under Linux. In fact, I took this one over to Andrew McMillan the other day. He plugged into his Debian box. We had a little bit of hardware wrestling, had to plug into a hub, but then boom, 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 he's got a good calibration in, you know, overall, including problems, half an hour. So, so then the next time he does this, it will probably take him five or ten minutes to recalibrate later. Names of those? Uh, well, this particular one is the Pantone or x Huey Pro. Depends who bought it when and one company bought another. But this one is directly supported into Linux. If you go to the Argyle CMS website, that lists all the different hardware that software works with. And that's what I used to run the calibration this time. Pantone's a proprietary product that you need to license from the company. What should we be doing instead? There are certain things out there, certain ways to do certain other things. One of the things is the, the way a lot of this comes down to is intellectual property laws and distribution and this and that. Inkscape as an application isn't allowed to put that, to give that to users. But end users can pull down files that have rough approximations. And then, of course, when you go out to print, you could do things in purple and yellow, and that you just, when you go to your print house, you have it labeled as Pantone 185. When they print out a plate, it's just gonna be black. It doesn't matter. Uh, but there are some palette management software out there that will go out and actually download it as a user. You can go to Pantone's website and download the, prof the, the color palette files yourself that has RGB equivalents that are somewhat rough. And then Scribus, as a project, has been collaborating with a lot of commercial vendors out there. I don't know if they've explicitly pulled in Pantone yet, but the German equivalent of Pantone has already given them files and given them permission to distribute with their next version some um, local color systems, and including, I think, in New Zealand, resin print or paints has been working very well with them and supplying them with information. And they've struck up a very good you know, balance of just addressing enough of the commercial vendor's concerns so that the commercial vendor says, okay, go ahead and distribute these files, read only. Users can make their own files derived off of it, but we want ours to be correct. That's all. And that's not an unreasonable thing. Any more questions? Okay, let's put our hands together for our speaker. Uh -huh. Now, on behalf of LCA, I'd like to give John this uh, bowl, which is made from Queensland macadamia nuts. Thank you.
at the flooded warehouses you may have heard about.